Hello everybody, David Shapiro here with another video. So today's video is uh, by popular demand uh, as we talk more and more about artificial intelligence and the uh, potential of UBI and AI displacing a lot of jobs. Uh, for some people, it seems like it's a foregone conclusion that a lot of people are gonna be out of work real soon, probably for good. Uh, there's more and more universal basic, in basic income experiments going on around the world. Uh, and if you didn't see it, I have another video called uh, Post-Labor Economics, which kind of talks about more of the macroeconomic aspects of that. But in this case, people really wanted to learn about uh, UBI on an individual level. So let's get right in. Uh, just a real quick plug for my Patreon before we get in. Um, I do have a Patreon, and uh, all tiers get you into the private Discord. Uh, where I am often available to chat with people. I also, I, there's two Patreon Discords. So there's the premium Patreon Discord, uh, which I prioritize, make sure that I answer all questions that people send me on Patreon if you're in the premium tier. Uh, and I also do have uh, occasional office hours uh, where we just all kind of get in a, in a voice chat together. And then I do all uh, have a higher tier for one-on-one -on -one sessions. All right, back to the show. So first, let's set the stage. Imagine this future scenario. Every American gets $2,000 a month, no questions asked, starting at age 18. Let's also, for the sake of this thought experiment, assume that healthcare is either heavily subsidized or uh, for all intents and purposes free. If you check out my uh, post-labor economics video, I talk about how uh, AI could lower the cost of, of lots of things, including healthcare, by a factor of 100x or 1,000x in the long run. Um, let's also assume that the unemployment rate will be about 70%. There are some people calling for more, um, some people calling for less, uh, but just looking at the number of jobs that are, uh, uh, vulnerable to being automated away with AI today, uh, my personal estimate is that it's around 70%. Uh, let's also assume for the sake of argument that parents get uh, a little bit of UBI per child, but it also tapers per child. Uh, so basically, uh, you want to you don't want to necessarily hand out uh, as much UBI for every child because that incentivizes some people to just keep having more children. Um, but on the other hand, you also want to ensure that uh, you know you incentivize the behaviors that you want to see. And so one thing that people are concerned about, some people uh, are concerned about, is population collapse. Actually, this is what we're seeing in places like Italy, Japan, North Korea. Uh, and, and other places where the population is actually already slowly contracting. And so you, you basically need to incentivize people to have children. You need to reward them. Right now, um, you get tax breaks uh, in the form of uh, dependent uh, tax uh, credit. Uh, so basically, this is kind of like a reverse, or not a reverse tax credit, but a tax credit in the form of increased income on a monthly basis to help pay for children. Um, let's also assume that GDP growth is going to be something like 15% uh, due to AI automation. So the idea is that uh, most people aren't working, but the GDP is still growing like crazy. The stock market is growing like crazy. So corporations and politicians, there's plenty of wealth to go around. So we're basically assuming that a state uh, exists of economic abundance um, and then also some redistribution. Oh, and there was a question. Someone was asking, what's the difference between this and socialism? So the difference between this and socialism is that socialism is about collective ownership or state ownership. So in this case, UBI actually fits within capitalism and neoliberalism because the state isn't owning anything. The state is just taxing and redistributing within the existing framework. Uh, another assumption that we're going to make, and I talked about this again in the um, post-labor economics video, is uh, we're basically going to assume that inflation and deflation are going to be modulated by some of these market forces uh, with things like quantitative easing, uh, tax rates, and that sort of stuff. So we're not going to address that further in this video. Just assume that prices are stable-ish. Okay, so absolute, just right off the bat, let's talk about budgeting. You get $2,000 a month, uh, no further questions asked. Uh, the first thing that everyone's thinking is the rent is still way too damn high for this. Uh, you know, my my mortgage payment, which is, you know, I bought this house almost 10 years ago. So before things went absolutely 
insane. Uh, my mortgage payment is about $1,200 a month, which is pretty good. Um, but that being said, the lowest mortgage payment I ever had was $325 a month for a $65,000 uh, apartment. Um, so it can be done. Obviously, as demand goes up in certain areas, the prices also go up. Uh, but point being is that for most people, that's just these numbers probably sound completely ridiculous. Like it's not going to happen again because again, 10 years ago, the economy has changed a lot. Inflation, supply and demand has changed. Um, we're facing housing crunches and recessions and all that kind of stuff. So again, it's like, oh, you know, everyone's heard like, you know, someone uh, from our parents or grandparents age, like, oh, you know, I pay, I put a, you know, family through college on, you know, a cashier's salary. Believe me, I am aware that economics change over time. We will address uh, the housing thing in just a minute. I'm just kind of setting the stage as to saying, okay, we need to figure out a way to get housing into $600 a month or so for everyone. Cars are another huge, huge expense for Americans. Um, so these are the two biggest expenses for most people. So, you know, for instance, I have friends that their car payment is six or $700 a month. That's insane. Um, you know, so you combine that with, uh, you know, let's, let's say I had a $600 car payment on top of a $1,200 mortgage. That's $1,800 a month, leaving $200 a month for everything else. That's not going to fly. That's not going to work. Um, now that being said, if we can get uh, rent or mortgages back down to $600 a month for most people that leaves 14 and, and if we can get rid of cars, that leaves about $1,400 a month for everything else. And also remember, in this hypothetical scenario, healthcare is uh, highly subsidized or functionally free for most people. Okay, so housing, biggest expense. Let's talk about housing first, because if we can get that under control, the whole UBI thing looks a lot more sustainable and feasible for most people. So the first thing is downsizing. Uh, a lot of people are already downsizing, Tiny houses are all the rage right now. Katrina cottages, um, that kind of kick-started it because after Hurricane Katrina, uh, a, actually what happened was a few celebrities got together and paid for um, architects to design cottages, small houses that were very cheap and easy to build um, so that uh, people that were affected by Katrina could um, uh, recover more quickly. Uh Ever, uh, that didn't start the tiny house trend, but that certainly put it on the map. And people are like, oh, Katrina houses, they're pretty cute. Because again, they paid for um, professional architects to make something that was um, sustainable and, uh, and appealing, not just cheap and efficient. So demand for smaller houses is creating new markets. There's, um, you know, last time I looked up at tiny houses a few years ago, there were not a whole lot of options. Now there are tiny house kits, there are prefabs, there are all kinds of stuff. Some of the some of the cheapest DIY like livable tiny houses that I could find were around four thousand dollars, which is much much more efficient than you know a two hundred thousand dollar house or a four hundred thousand dollar house. You can also get pre built for around twelve k, and that's you know starting price. You can spend up to two hundred k on a prefab tiny house, um, which is still cheaper than you know a half a million dollar <laughs> uh, suburban house. Uh, one thing, one of the biggest problems with tiny houses is that um, regulations and zoning laws need to be uh, updated. Uh, in many municipalities and jurisdictions, a tiny house is not allowed to be the primary residence. You can have what's called an auxiliary dwelling unit in many places, which is basically you can put a tiny house in your backyard, but then you need a regular full-sized house. So um, my wife and I, we're about to downsize, but even in the countryside, the minimum house size that we're allowed to build is 1,200 square feet. So it's smaller than my current house, but it still doesn't qualify as a tiny house. We would love to have built something smaller, but uh, because, of the, because of the county zoning laws, we're not allowed to build anything smaller. So in order to accommodate a shift to a UBI, we're going to need different zoning laws or areas that are zoned for tiny houses. Another option is um, portable tiny houses, such as trailers or van dwelling. Uh, now, lots of people, you know, there's the van dwelling subreddit. There's plenty of um, influencers on TikTok and YouTube and uh, Instagram and everywhere else um, that either travel or live in a van full time or whatever. Uh, this is this is good for some people. It can be very cheap. You can also spend a lot of money uh, pimping out a van or a bus or whatever. Um, there are challenges associated with this, such as uh, safety, where do you stay, permanent address. It also requires a vehicle, which again, vehicles can be really expensive. 
Um, the last uh, thing is micro apartments. So not everyone wants to own um, their own home or their own land. So micro apartments are something that is an option. Um, they're increasingly popular. Uh, but again, there's a lot of regulations, uh, particularly in America, that prevent us from even building tiny uh, apartments. Usually the smallest studio apartment you can get is around four to 500 square feet, uh, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But those are often in trendy areas. And so even though it's a small apartment, they're often very, very expensive. Um, so they're not really optimized for being economical. That being said, as I mentioned, as the market demand for these things goes up, the pressure for cities to accommodate that and for the, the capitalist class, for the, for the corporations to accommodate that will go up. Um, and again, there's lots of experiments going on, but there hasn't been a uh, new establishment. And so one thing that I want to talk about is in the context of history, the American suburbs, those were intentionally designed about 80 years ago. Uh, after World War II, um, as as the, the the nation was beginning to urbanize very quickly, uh, you know, all the regulations and patterns and architectural designs and and municipal layouts that didn't exist. The modern suburb, the subdivision, was a new invention. And so the fact that we had we invented a new way of living within the last century tells me that we can invent a new way of living again. And it probably won't take that long. Because uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And certainly uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And we will need to figure out alternative ways of living that are not centered on the American suburb. Um, another option other than downsizing is combining households. So this is called co-living or co-housing. There are uh, successful uh, co-housing and co-living um, things around the world. In America, they're usually actually more expensive because of construction costs, regulations, red tape, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in many cases, uh, particularly if you look on, on Reddit under the co-housing and co-living sub subreddits, there are plenty of horror stories of very, very dangerous, manipulative people building these communities. Um, so I want to urge caution uh, before you get involved in any of those kinds of things. Um, now, that being said, there are uh, successful examples in America, but there are more successful examples around the world, uh, particularly in Europe in various places. Uh, there's eco villages, which are uh, focused on sustainability. Uh, and they're basically like uh, uh, co-op farms, essentially. Uh, now, that being said, there is uh, there's a lot of rising trends around co-living in conventional houses. You don't necessarily need a special village or a special structure, right? Because that's where the red tape and regulation and ex excess cost comes in. What a lot of people do is actually just combine finances and live in a larger house. And so there is a, a trend that started a few years ago called momunes. And there's actually services that can help single moms find each other to join forces, band together, and, and combine households. Uh, obviously, not everyone is a, is a single mother, uh, so that model doesn't work for everyone. But, you know, put it this way. Uh, some of my friends in my 20s, uh, they got together and rented a large house. And so having two or three couples living together, or even just a few friends, you know, three, four, five friends living together, if you combine those incomes and you end up with eight or $12,000 per month guaranteed income from universal basic income from, from combining households, you can afford a pretty nice house for that. Uh, and so this is a pretty simple model. Um, but what I will say is that finding the right people can be challenging. Um, certainly there have been, there are plenty of cases of people having gotten stuck with toxic roommates or destructive uh, partners or whatever and getting trapped in those situations. So we will need to keep in mind that some people are going to be better and safer living on their own. Certainly plenty of people want, want to live that way. Um, but that being said, the social advantages that come from joining forces and banding together, um, of course, we just got, uh, we're on the tail end of the pandemic, in which case a lot of people actually were kind of forced into that situation. You know, we created our little survival groups, right? It was like the walking dead. Um, you know, you band together. Uh, so anyways, uh, whether you downsize or join forces or a little bit of both, those are ways that you can drastically reduce uh, housing costs uh, here in America. 
Again, the biggest thing is that uh, particularly on the downsizing, we need to update our zoning laws and regulations to accommodate this. But I have no doubt that the that the pressure from people to do this will uh, will kind of force um, the government's hand. Um, all right, so transportation. I mentioned you know cars are really expensive, and America is a car culture. So how do we how do we reduce transportation costs? The first thing is walkable cities. So. Most cities, I don't, I don't know about most, but many cities in Europe were designed and built and founded long before cars. Uh, and so because of that, walkability is kind of intrinsic to a lot of European cities. However, whoops, come back. Um, a lot of American cities uh, were designed and built with cars in mind. And so because of that, a lot of American cities are designed around the car. They actually prioritize uh, and privilege cars over pedestrians, which is super, super problematic. Now, that being said, there are literally dozens of major projects going on around the world to experiment with new walkable cities. Uh, and then, of course, there are um, you know hundreds, if not thousands, of smaller experiments, uh, you know, of like urban revitalization. Uh, the cities uh, near where I live, um, all up and down the East Coast in the South, um, they're they're building walkable areas. Maybe not the entire city is walkable, but some of it is walkable. And so this focus on green spaces and walkability um, is rising. There's a couple of YouTube channels I want to recommend. Um, one is City Beautiful and the other is Not Just Bikes. These are really great channels. They're really informative and they will point out all of the things wrong with American cities, um, the things that some American cities get right, that'll compare uh, American cities with European and Asian cities as well. Um, but for instance, I've been to Paris, and I was surprised at at such a sprawling city. Um, I was at the on the at the cathedral on the hill, Sacre Coeur, um, which means Sacred Heart, and I know I didn't say, say it with the right accent. Um, but it's literally Paris at, to the horizon. You cannot see outside of the city from the middle of the city. Um, but you don't need a car in Paris. It's wild. And like as an American, that was the first time I had been one in a city that big, but two in a in a in a fully walkable city. Um, some of the metros were fully automated, which was really cool because you could go all the way up to the front and look out the front windows. Um, there's buses, there's light rail, um, and then of course uh, you know they have the TGV, which is the high speed rail to get outside of the city. Um, anyways, point being is that there are lots of these experiments going on. And so for people that want to stay living inside of a city, if you combine those micro apartments or those co-living situations with walkability, that will drastically, drastically reduce cost of living for, for many people. It will take some time to build this up, especially since we've got so much invested in being a car culture. Uh, but ride sharing, um, and, and fully automated cars are coming and I actually forgot to create a slide for this. But one of the things that a lot of the big auto manufacturers want to do is actually have fleets of robo taxis. And so rather than owning a car, you'll just use an app to summon, you know, you know, a Ford or a Chevy or a Toyota or whatever. Um, and as, uh, competition drives down price, um, I think I did a, a calculation once that, the the total the total annual cost for me if I were to if I were able to switch to a robo taxi based on the hypothetical rider mile cost would probably be about six hundred dollars a year and I'm someone who drives twenty thousand miles per year so the possibility of doing ride shares and robo taxis could drastically drastically reduce the cost of ownership for um, automobiles or rather you get rid of the ownership cost and you just rent. Uh, in real time. Um, another thing is if you don't want to live in the city, because I sure as heck don't want to live in the city, I am not a city boy, I'm a country boy, um, is what I call coaster villages. And these are starting to pop up. They're often just called like tiny house communities or RV communities or whatever. Um, but again, this is one of the things where, uh, where zoning laws need to be updated. But fortunately, these experiments are going. But basically, think of the Shire, think of Hobbiton, but instead of, you know, underground houses, it's tiny houses and Katrina cottages uh, and, and, and uh, tag along kind of um, kind of trailers. Uh, basically, what I anticipate is going to happen is that in cheap rural land, a lot of that land is going to end up being used for very, very small planned, uh, nearly self-sufficient, not necessarily fully self-sufficient. I'm not saying an eco village, but 
rather than having uh, these things planned around cars and subdivisions, it'll be planned around uh, sustainability. And so the, what I mean by coaster is someone who decides, you know what, I'm just going to coast on UBI. I'm going to be happy with that. But I also want to live in the countryside. Uh, you will need things like HOAs because, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, good regulations and good agreements make good neighbors. Um, and so you will need stuff like HOAs still in some of these places, but the total cost of living there is going to be much, much lower. Because imagine if your plot of land and your tiny house is about $40,000 total, right? The mortgage payment on that is going to be like 80 bucks a month or something like that. Uh, maybe, may, well, let's say 200 bucks a month. You can afford that. Um, that's going to be a, a tenth of your uh, monthly $2,000 uh, income. Uh, so between these two possibilities, walkable cities for those who want the urban living and and tiny house villages out in the countryside, we can probably accommodate a lot of people very efficiently and very cheaply. Okay, cool. So I think, uh, oh, and also another advantage of these coaster villages is you don't necessarily need a car. Uh, you know, if you live like Bilbo Baggins and, and Frodo, you just walk to your neighbors. It's a tiny little village. All right. Now, one thing that a lot of people ask is, okay, yeah, but what, you know, what if I still want more money? What if I'm willing to work? What if I'm able to work? Um, what is, what are the options going to be so that I can still, you know, make some money and get by? So after doing a lot of research, one thing that I found is that uh, local goods and services, um, there's going to be a lot of these that are going to stick around. And this is because even if a robot can do it, these are these are things that you still prefer a human to do and that most humans will be willing to pay another human to do. So the first category is the health and wellness stuff. So this includes fitness coaches, personal trainers, massage therapists, that sort of stuff. These are the these are the kind of things that require a human touch or human empathy, or at least those are highly preferable. So this will be things like uh, barbers and dentists and massage therapists, that sort of thing. Um, education, tutoring, mentoring, and coaching. These are also things that uh, that could be um, pretty durable against uh, being automated away. Certainly, uh, some online learning is going to be fully replaced by uh, things like ChatGPT. Excuse me. Many students are already using ChatGPT for learning and mentoring and tutoring. And certainly, I mean, even I use that if there's something that I want to learn about. It is one of the best uh, teaching resources out there because it's interactive. Now, that being said, there are still going to be plenty of classes and skills that are going to be better taught by a human because a human has the same uh, abilities and capacities that you do. So say, for instance, you go to a painting class or a cooking class um, or a carpentry class. Uh, those are the kinds of things that, that you will you will prefer to pay for a human just for the experience of being with other people, right? Another thing is going to be um, experiences such as performances in entertainment, local music, stage performances, busking, um, uh, you know, those sorts of things are going to be uh, pretty resilient because, again, we are a social species and so we want that connection with other people. Uh, Ren fairs, I think, are going to be really popular. <laughs> um, and so, you, you know, you can go set up your booth and do face painting at a Ren fair or, or whatever kind of festival or convention you want to go to. Um, caregiving, grooming, and hygiene, these are other things. Um, so whether it is child care or elder care uh, or pet care, those kinds of jobs are going to be very resilient against being fully automated away. Because uh, again, even if you do have a robot that can take care of grandma, grandma probably would want to see you rather than a robot, to, un unless you don't get along. Maybe, maybe it's better that way. Um, but also like your dog, right? Like my dog hates machines, right? So he would freak out if, if a robot showed up to take him for a walk. So, um, you know, granted I'll, I, I, I work at home all day, every day, so I don't need pet walkers, but some people would. Other domestic services like gardening, lawn care, cooking, cleaning, um, growing and sharing food. These are things that uh, will probably persist as well. Uh, because again, local economies, circular economies, these are rising in popularity. And then finally, artisan uh, and, and craftsmen, handmade goods, arts and crafts. These are the kinds of things that people will really value and cherish. And it's also something that a machine intrinsically cannot do. In the age where 
uh, machines can make all kinds of furniture and mass produce it, we still already have Etsy where you can buy handmade clothing and handmade furniture and handmade tools. Uh, and so the demand is already there. And one thing that, that can happen of, of spend, and yes, they're more expensive, but these are much higher quality goods and they're also much more durable. Uh, so again, even if those, even if mass produced goods become cheaper due to AI, there's still going to be a demand for those high quality handmade, uh, unique, um, goods and arts and crafts. Now, okay, so that's local uh, goods and services. There's also still going to be um, online and remote. So content creators like me, probably going to stick around. Um, uh, influencers, streamers, whether it's a lifestyle blog or travel blog or whatever. I, follow, I started following lots of lifestyle bloggers. Um, usually they're attractive uh, women because, you know, that's just the pattern. Um, but I also follow plenty of, uh, plenty of guys who like build stuff or go on adventures, that kind of thing. Uh, and the reason that I think that these are going to stick around is because even if you have a fully digital avatar, your brain knows that it's fake, right? Uh, some people of course will be plenty entertained by, uh, you know, a digital avatar, but really as a human, I want to see another human's experience. I want to learn from that human, I want to empathize with that person. And so content influence streamers, you know, it's the personality, it's the realness, the authenticity. Um, even if even if there is some performance associated with it, that's what people really want to connect with. Um, crowdfunding platforms like Patreon, OnlyFans, plenty of other alternatives are out there. Those are going to stick around. Uh, and, and so basically the two ways that you can make money online in the future, I think, are going to be ads and crowdfunding. Um, there's also white label services like uh, subscription-based services, um, but that's essentially crowdfunding, right? It's like you, you pay to get in and then you get access to ex exclusive content. Um, game hosts, coach, coaches, and, and trainers of various kinds. So one of my Patreon supporters is actually a, a, a professional online coach and um, she teaches other coaches. And this is actually a really, really huge uh, market segment. I had no idea how big it was. Um, but again, having that one-on-one -on -one time with someone where you can say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with, because we're humans, we're always gonna be struggling with something, right? Um, but then like game hosts, there's paid dungeon masters that can host, uh, that can run D&D campaigns for you. All kinds of stuff is possible online that are intrinsically better done if it's a human. That being said, there are plenty of people working on using GPT technologies to automate, uh, uh, you know, game hosts and that sort of stuff. So some of this is going to be is going to change, but a lot of these things, again, people are willing are are uh, the demand for the human is high enough that people are going to be willing to pay for it. Uh, now, on top of making more money on with the UBI, uh, there is also a lot that you can do to reduce to further reduce costs. Obviously, the biggest things are housing and transportation. We already talked about how to reduce the costs there. There's a lot of other stuff that we can do to keep reducing costs in order to um, make better use of the free time that we have. So, for instance, tool sharing, tool libraries. Um, there's actually I didn't realize this, but many county libraries or or um, you know uh, city libraries already have tools that you can check out. Uh, and then of course, if the demand for that goes up, then libraries you know, will continue to do that. Um, there's also maker spaces that you can join usually with a small fee that give you a space to build stuff and borrow tools. Um, circular economics, which is you know reusing as much as you can. Refurbishing stuff, we're gonna talk about refurbishing more in a future slide. Uh, clothing exchanges, clothing swaps, um, other good swaps. Like one thing that I do is that uh, every now and then um, I just, I have a, a folding card table and I'll put it out by the road and I just will give stuff away, right? And so um, by just giving stuff away and sharing, right? You don't even have to worry about, um, you know, bartering or exchanging or, or buying stuff, just giving stuff away and, and making use of those um, uh, es essentially community-based donations. Um, sharing services as well. So say for instance, um, you know, you might uh, provide childcare for people in your community, not necessarily for pay, but in exchange, they give you food or something, right? Uh, so that goes back to bartering and trading. Uh, DIY skills, uh, repairing things, uh, fixing things, uh, cleaning up, whatever. There's lots and lots of value that you can get by learning more skills and thus further reducing costs. 
Uh, caregiving, domestic stuff, I already mentioned that. Okay, so let's talk about the psychology of this. One thing that people are concerned about is, yeah, but what do you do for fun? What do you do for a sense of mastery? What do you do for challenge? If I lose my job, you know, how do I have any sense of self-esteem? So let's talk about the psychology of living under UBI. First, we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to use uh, frameworks for this. So first, one of the most uh, famous ones is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. So if you're not familiar with Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, it is basically just this pyramid, uh, which is color-coded like the uh, food pyramid if you're in America. Um, but it, it says you need to satisfy these needs starting from bottom to top. So physiological needs include air, water, food, shelter, sleep, that sort of stuff. Safety needs, which is about, you know, are you in physical danger? Um, do you feel safe at home? Is, is your environment quiet enough? Um, are, are there any, you know, dangerous smells or chemicals or whatever? Above that, once you have those needs met, the next uh, most fundamental need is love and belonging. So you need friends, you need family, um, you need to feel that human connection. Um, and of course, we're in a loneliness crisis. I think something like 30% of young people today don't have a single like best friend, which is really horrible. And I'm hoping that UBI gives us more free time to connect with people. Uh, above love and belonging, you need esteem, self-esteem, which is self-respect, um, status, recognition, that sort of stuff. And then finally, self-actualization. So this is what a lot of people are referring to when they, when they worry about, okay, well, if I lose my job, what am I going to do? I need some kind of self-actualization. And so self-actualization is the impulse to become the best version of yourself. That is the, that is the version to reach your highest level, right? Uh, and so these are things that are still going to need to be there. And we'll talk about this um, in future slides. Um, in terms of how can how can you achieve your best the best version of yourself? Um, another framework that I'm a big fan of is a, what's called TLC or therapeutic lifestyle changes. This was a model that was developed by Roger Walsh, and it is an eight point framework that talks about how do you make a better life for yourself. So the framework is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. One, and this is in no particular order, by the way. One, spirituality. So being involved in some kind of spirituality. It doesn't have to be a mega church or anything like that. Um, you know, paganism, witchcraft, uh, neo-Hellenism, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. Norse Reconstructionists. Lots and lots of spiritual frameworks are kind of becoming popular as uh, certainly a lot of us younger people are more pagan. Um, giving back, so volunteering and community service is one of the things that, um, you know, again, we kind of alluded to this already in terms of cost reduction, uh, but giving back, volunteering, um, giving your time is actually a really good way to build up uh, self-esteem. It's deeply satisfying. Um, like I said, one thing that I love is just giving stuff away. <laughs> um, and if I had more free time and, 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 uh, and energy, I would probably volunteer more. Um, because I have certain skills. And, you know, honestly, a, a lot of the code that I give away, because I publish all of my code under under open source standards, um, to me, that is kind of like giving back. And it's very satisfying. I love seeing the little stars and forks on my GitHub uh, repos. Time in nature, um, hiking, walking, going to the lake, whatever. This is really important for your physical and mental health. I go for a walk pretty much every day. Um, at lens, unless the weather is bad or um, unless I'm sick or too tired. Uh, recreational activities, we're going to talk a lot about recreational activities um, in upcoming slides. Rest and relaxation. If you don't have to go to work, you can spend a lot more time resting and relaxing. Diet and nutrition. We've talked a lot about uh, how, or we will talk more about how um, all the free time that you get from UBI will allow you to do things like gardening, but also allow you to learn to cook and spend more time cooking. Because a lot of people don't have time to cook good meals because they're too busy working uh, and resting. And so UBI with additional free time will help people really improve their diet and nutrition. Seven, um, exercise and activity. So this is like exercising for the sake of exercise, um, which for me, I get that with time in nature because I go for walks um, and I also uh, like to do other things, although I haven't done it as much lately. Hiking, climbing, that sort of stuff, kayaking. Uh, relationships and connection. We already talked about relationships and connection um, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And also you will see that relationships and connection, spending time with friends and family is, is common for all psychological well-being frameworks. 
self-determination theory. This is one of my favorite frameworks because it is so simple um, and it kind of encapsulates a lot, but it's also not a hierarchy. It's you need all three of these at all times. Um, and so the idea is that uh, self-determination theory is this is what is this is what people are intrinsically motivated by. These are the intrinsic psychological needs of all humans. So first is autonomy um, or individual liberty. We need to feel like we are in control of our lives and our fate. This is absolutely critical for all humans. Even humans in collectivist societies, there's always a tension between individual needs and group needs. Um, but that's intrinsic to all social species. It's about balancing the self versus the group. Um, desire for competence and mastery. So this, is, this has to do with Maslow's top hierarchy of needs, which is self-esteem and self-actualization. So competence and mastery, the, the, the basically feeling like you're good at something. One way to measure this is that we thrive with what's called optimal stress. So optimal stress means that you need some kind of challenge. For instance, people play Elden Ring. People play Dark Souls, these really frustrating, impossible games that I personally don't like. Um, but the idea is that you try and fail, and then when you finally succeed, um, you feel a sense of mastery, right? And of course, video games are not the only way to get mastery, but video games are a good way to get a sense of mastery. And as we'll talk about once we talk about hobbies, there are lots and lots of, of other ways to get that sense of mastery. Finally, desire for relatedness and connection. As a social species, we are intrinsically motivated to seek out connection with others. And so by keeping in mind what our intrinsic base needs are and building a life around that, we can still maintain our psychological well-being even if we don't have a career, um, at least a conventional career that we're familiar with. Okay, as I promised, hobbies. Uh, this is the last section of the video, and this is honestly where I had the most fun, and it made me really realize I am looking forward to this. Um, so I'm going to do everything that I can to help make this uh, future state come to fruition with my YouTube channel and my open source research. So the first thing, obviously, gaming. A lot of you tell me how excited you are for the possibility of FDVR, which means full dive virtual reality. Everyone knows what FDVR is. You saw it in the Matrix. The idea is that you plug your head in, um, and as far as you can tell, it is 100% real. We also explored this with um, Ready Player One, which had like uh, haptic suits. Um, I don't know if it's possible. A haptic suit seems like it's probably more possible in the near term. Full dive VR, such as the, what you see in the Matrix, might not be possible, but you never know. People are working on uh, brain-computer interfaces, so if you can just plug in all the sensory information directly into your head, maybe it's possible. Anyways, whatever you want to do, whatever experience you want to have, should hypothetically be possible with FDVR. Um, a part of gaming is that it can be social, right? Game with friends, whether you're competing online with friends uh, or you got a guild or a clan that you've built. Um, you can also uh, do parallel play in person. So this is what um, I do with my wife. We heckle each other. Um, while she's playing Assassin's Creed, I'll be like, hey, did you know that you're on fire? And she's like, yes, Dave, I know that I'm on fire. Uh, you know, <laughs> parallel play is a great thing to do with friends. You can sit around, you know, I used to do this back in my college days with my buddies, drinking a couple beers, playing Call of Duty, trolling each other. Um, it can be a really great thing. And I'm glad to see that the younger generations do this still. Uh, my nephew and all of his friends, they play Minecraft together and other things. Um, there are, I will, what I will say is there are some potential downsides. Um, screen time can be detrimental to your health, uh, but if you balance it with some of the other things like in uh, the therapeutic lifestyle changes, make sure that you go outside. Touch grass, as kids are saying these days. Um, it can also be addictive and isolation is possible. Uh, I do suspect that we will see um, legislation coming that kind of at least provides warnings for how addictive things are. Uh, there's a book that I refer to often uh, called Liquid Rain, where they talk about how uh, full dive VR could actually be programmatically addictive, like where it could just stimulate your dopamine. And so you feel like you're having more fun than you actually are. And then when you're not in the full dive VR, you could you could like physically crave it and get sick if you don't have it. So we do need to be careful with um, creating gaming as a central lifestyle. Uh, and another thing is that uh, a gaming world is not necessarily the real world, and most people's brains will keep track of that difference. Um, and so it might not be good for self-actualization. For instance, if you're, if you're a gamer, you might not uh, get the sense that you're reaching your full potential. That being said, if you're a competitive gamer, uh, maybe that is the way that you reach your full potential. Making and fixing things. 
We humans evolved to use our hands. That is why we have so much dexterity in our hands. We are the tool users. And so one of my best friends from back in the day is working on rebuilding a thistle. So this is a thistle. It's a small racing boat. We would be doing this all day, every day, if we had UBI and no need to uh, work for money. Because um, the, the shop where he's rebuilding his, there's two other ones that are just waiting for someone to come and fix. And if I had the time, that's what I'd be doing. Why? Because it's something that my friend does and you can then race it and do competitive stuff. But there's also skill building, right? The sense of mastery that you get from building something, from fixing it, and having that thing that you can show off and use, this is a really great way to get a sense of mastery. There's plenty of other things that people do. Lots of guys like rebuild Mustangs or Corvettes, um, fixing up old houses and other things. So reusing refurbishing, fixing, building things. These are really great ways that also tap into really primal needs for humans. Some of the things that are really popular today, particularly uh, with young people, forging, leatherworking, sewing, um, other carpentry, all of these things revolve around tool use. And so whatever hobby you pick up, if it uses tools, chances are there's a lot of skills involved, which can also lead to that sense of mastery. Um, cooking, I mentioned this earlier. Cooking is one of the oldest trades, one of the oldest professions out there, and everyone needs to eat, plus cooking is a good social activity. Um, my wife and I cook together pretty much every day, or at least we take turns. Um, some people compulsively cook and feed other people. My sister-in-law is like that. She loves cooking for people. Point being is that there are, there are a lot of hobbies out there um, that center around making or fixing things. Outdoor stuff. Hiking, climbing, canoeing, boating, whatever. There's all kinds of stuff that we could uh, stand to do more of um, if, you, uh, if you had more free time because you didn't have to work, because you didn't have to be at a desk or at an office or at the store or whatever. Um, you know, and it's not just fishing. Obviously, that's the prototypical example where, you know, you know, a guy gets to retirement age and he decides he's going to go fishing every day. Not everyone wants to do that. I get it. Um, you could do competitive fishing, um, but there's also other uh, kinds of competitive outdoor stuff like cross country challenges. I ran Tough Mudder almost 10 years ago um, and I was hung over as Heck, when I ran it, I was not hung over by the end of it. I burned all that, all that, uh, all that toxins off. Um, skiing, kayaking, all kinds of really challenging stuff that you can do outside. A lot of my friends picked up mountain biking, which you could do practically anywhere um, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so one thing that I realized when I was making this video is that if if we got UBI tomorrow, um, I would probably go hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, I love being outside. I love being in the mountains. And that is something that I want to do. But right now, my brain is like, well, I'm still got to make YouTube. I still got to do AI stuff. I still have meetings with my Patreon supporters. So doing the, the Appalachian Trail is not really an option for me right now, unless I were to take like three months off, which maybe I should. Anyways, fitness. Fitness is the most familiar model that a lot of people use to get mastery, whether it's yoga or Pilates or running or cycling, martial arts, uh, strength training. These are all things that people, um, many, many people do, and, and it, it can be a little cultish for some people. Uh, there's also fitness-based competitions like Ironman, American Ninja, that sort of stuff. That being said, there are many, many, many additional benefits um, it, other than just, you know, it's something to do. Uh, better fitness it leads to reduced pain, increased health, uh, cognitive benefits, emotional benefits. Plus you get to show off your body, right? There's lots of people that love being fit just for the sake of feeling sexy, right? There are so many people that um, that I that I knew and have met and uh, where they decided to get fit, um, you know, started climbing, started going to the gym. And the 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 transformation that they felt as they felt better about themselves, about their body, the sense of accomplishment that they get from that is incredible. It's still not for everyone. So I want to say like, okay, even if you have all the options in the world and you decide that exercise isn't for you, that's fine. Or, or fit, fitness. Exercise is for everyone. Fitness might not be for you. Meetups. So I am a huge fan of meetup.com. I actually met my now wife at a meetup. Um, we're both writers. Um, so the, the kinds of tools that are out there, so meetup.com is there specifically for finding people with the same interests, challenges, or whatever, right? 
Uh, so meetup.com, it's free to join. Um, I tell people about it all the time. I think more people should be on meetup, whether, um, you, you know, you have a special interest, um, or if you've got something that you're coping with, there's, there's, uh, support groups, um, on meetup. Uh, I host a local AI meetup. Um, I'm actually going to that later today. Um, let's see, there's intellectual kinds of things. There's chess clubs, there's spirituality, uh, clubs, arts, crafts, photography, all kinds of stuff. Whatever your interest is, especially if you live in a city, you can find other people that have that same interest, uh, which is a really great way um, to get those, that, that uh, social connection. But then also some of these things can lead to senses of mastery, for instance. All right, so this is life under UBI. Uh, I hope that you got a lot out of this. Um, and like I said, making this video, actually, I kind of clarified a lot for myself and it makes me personally a lot more excited for the future. And I'm personally, this was probably the most fun that I've had making a video uh, yet. So anyways, cheers.